Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd, I'll be your host for the next hour of gardening advice and answering your questions. You can get in touch with our phone volunteers, dial 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. If you want to send us an email or a JPEG picture, that address is byf at unl.edu. We really need to know as much information as you can provide, including where you live in the state, to give us a little bit of help. And remember that those emailed questions are answered on future shows, not tonight. So send those in quickly so we can go through them and make sure we get them answered. All right, Jonathan, you have something in a little vial. Yes, I have two somethings. I talk about pests a lot on the show, and so I thought I would bring some happy bugs instead this time. And so I brought a couple of predators that are out and about in the spring, and they're adults, so they're kind of showy and interesting looking. I'm gonna leave them on the table down here. On this side, we've got the pink lady beetle, also known as the 12 spotted ladybug. Can you guess how many spots it has and what 11. color it is? <laughs> yeah, yeah, very good. You're all very sarcastic. <laughs> they overwinter as adults and they come out in the spring and they help to eat a lot of aphids and other pests that we have in the area. One lady beetle can eat over 5,000 aphids in its lifetime. These ones are also unique because they have about half their diet made up of pollen. And I have a lot of them in my yard because I have a lot of dandelions, which is one of their preferred hosts. Then we look over here and we have a jumping spider, which is not gonna be able to jump very well in her little container. Jumping spiders have really big front eyes that they use to judge distance and to see things that they wanna eat. And when they jump, they leave a little sticky trail of silk behind them and they can jump several lengths of their own body and then they have a guideline to get back if they over jump what they wanna eat. And they can see really well compared to most other spiders. I think this one is a tan jumping spider, but these are both overwinters as adults and you can find them outside right now if you wanted to take out some students or kids and show them some cool predators as part of the food ecology landscape that we have around part of this part of Nebraska. Wonderful, I've never actually heard of a pink Ladybug. Yeah, it's one of our more common native ones. There we go. Thank you, Jonathan. All right, Matt, one of our more common <laughs> awful weeds, right? Yes. Yeah, so I got uh, not a happy weed. I no, guess like the that's happy okay. Bugs, but uh, this is prostrate knotweed, um, and we're seeing it now uh, maturing, and it's not quite seeding out yet, but it will be in the next month. So it's one weed that you probably want to get out and treat. Uh, it's, it's an annual, and it usually comes up around February, March. Uh, so it's it's growing very rapidly right now. Um, it's usually on thin spots in the lawn, usually next to sidewalks where compaction is or in areas that are kind of waterlogged. Uh, and it'll actually make a nice lawn if you leave it and mow it. Uh, it grows prostrate along the ground and it just keeps spreading and spreading and one plant can actually grow to you know a couple feet. Uh, so treating it now is important to basically prevent the seeds from uh, overwintering and starting again next year. And that's the biggest thing with this one because it germinates so early, it's tough to control with pre-emergent herbicides. There's only one that really works great and it's isoxabin. And that one is kind of expensive and it's easier to treat it now so that it doesn't seed out. Uh, so some of the products that work well, uh, obviously 2,4-D works, but it's not a great control. Uh, so 2,4-D in combination with triclopyr or MCPP. So those three ingredients, uh, 2,4-D, triclopyr, or dicamba, and MCPP, those three uh, work really well on it. And there's probably five or six products by different companies that have those three ingredients in it. And the best thing to do is thicken up that turf. Right? Yeah, that's the first thing. Aerification helps to uh, loosen it up and get some yeah. grass in there. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Matt. Yep. I hope that's not Hostavirus X. Well, you're wrong then. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry to disappoint Kim, but I did indeed bring some Hostavirus X. So another very common uh, disease that we see in a lot of our landscapes. One of the problems with Hostavirus X is it can go unnoticed in a landscape for quite a few years. Um, and depending on your variety of Hosta, the symptoms will really be different. So one of the things that we try to look for with Hostavirus X is just basically abnormal growth. And so if you're able to see some of the crinkling of, the, of these leaves a little bit, um, there's some stippling. Again, it's just it's the more, more crinkling down here, we can maybe see it a little bit better. And that's a pretty common sign of, of Hostavirus X. Another thing that we can see here is we do have some of this natural variegation that's occurring um, in the Hostas here but they're kind of leaky, and so the colors are leaking out um, outside of the veins, and that leaky coloration can be another sign of Hostavirus X. 
like I said, it, uh, symptoms really depend on the variety of hosta that you're looking at. So the best way is to hold up what you think is a sick leaf to what you think is a healthy leaf. And if you can see differences, there's a good chance that maybe it is infected. As far as control, rogue it out. And don't throw it in the compost. And don't, do not throw it in the compost. The, uh, the virus cannot survive in the soil, but it will survive in infected material for quite a while. All right, thank you so much <laughs> for everybody who loves hostas and now they're all worried. Which yes. Is. Good, go look at your hostas. All right, Elizabeth, the remains of a plant. The remains, it's supposed to look like this. Um, that, that's how we're gonna start. Um, what it is, is early in the season, you know our tulips and our daffodils and all of our uh, bulbs are looking really good. They're looking great, they're green, they're growing. And then we get to this point in the year and some of the tulips are starting to fade. The foliage is turning yellow or brown and it's starting to lose its color. Um, when we take a look at this guy, we're starting to see that color start to go down. So we're gonna start getting a lot of calls. When do I cut back my foliage on my bulbs? When do I need to dig them? When do I need to transplant them? When should I do this? So with our bulbs right now, we're gonna let them go naturally go dormant. We're gonna let this foliage fade on its own. We're not gonna try to remove it too early because what's happening is that bulb is storing energy um, at this point in time. When that foliage begins to turn yellow and fade, then we know at that point in time it's no longer doing its job. So what you want to do is then you want to flag those areas where those tulips are at if you want to transplant them in the future. And ideally we shoot for fall as being that ideal time that we want to transplant them. The reason we say mark them now is because this foliage is gonna go away and you're not gonna have any idea where those bulbs are located at once that foliage is gone. Can you dig them now? Yes, you can but you can store them inside on a single layer on a screen where they have good air circulation or good airflow, and then we wanna to shoot to plant them in the fall. So that way they get their chilling requirements so they bloom then the following year. So if you're able to leave them in the ground now, great. If you can't, you can dig them, but it's not the ideal time. And it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work no matter what, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> buy new ones or dig, all right. Picture questions, starting, Jonathan, with okay. Ord, Nebraska. Okay. 10-year-old plus Aspen. This has happened about two years ago on one of the smaller ones. He scrubbed it off. He thinks it's oyster scale, oyster shell scale. Uh -huh. Wonders uh, whether they are susceptible to it. And should they get rid of the tree or get rid of the oyster shell scale? Okay. <laughs> oyster shell scale, which is kind of a tongue twister if you're not careful. It is something that likes to feed on aspen trees. It also likes cotone aster and ash and lilac. And when they get on the tree, just like all of our scale insect pals, they glue themselves down and they feed in one spot and they draw the sap of the plant and they can weaken it overall. And with them on aspens, it actually can be even worse. They can make the plant more susceptible to certain diseases by making the bark kind of split open. So we definitely want to treat these. When I look at that tree, it doesn't look like it needs to go. Uh, if it's a mature tree, part of your landscape provides some shade, I would encourage you to try and treat the, pe the pest and get rid of it and keep the tree. You can go out and right now observe for the crawlers, their little yellow dots that are moving around. That's the immature stage of the scale. You're gonna to wanna to treat those with a pyrethroid or a summer oil to destroy them. Or if you wanted to treat the tree just sort of systemically, you can use dinotefuron pellets. According to some research at Colorado State, that particular neonicotinoid is effective on oyster shell scale. Okay, even though it's a neonicotinoid. Right, you want to wait until after the plant has flowered. That way you're not harming pollinators. You're good pollinators. now. You're good. You're good. <laughs> you just said what we're trying you're to get good. you to say. After, after, after. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, Matt, this is a COZAD viewer, uh, wonders whether it would be safe for him to wipe glyphosate on the bluegrass that has invaded his buffalo grass. Yes, I would say go ahead and wipe it, especially with that. It's like a common blue that greens up really early. It grows really tall. Every time you mow it, it's gonna grow back way faster than the buffalo grass at this point. So if you can wipe it, just make sure you're not wiping it on any of the green leaves on the buffalo grass, because that's what's gonna kill the buffalo grass. Uh, so as long as you keep it on those green leaves of the Kentucky bluegrass, which looks like in that picture, uh, you should be safe. All right, excellent, thank you. All right, Kyle, um, we had honey locust questions last week that mm -hmm. Amy answered that were canker on the trunk and those kinds of things. Getting more, this is actually Torrington, Wyoming, Ooh. and the pictures of the tree itself. So big, beautiful tree, uh, wondering 
what this is. Is this a canker? Is that just old bark? What can be done about it? Yeah. What do you think? Well, um, so just the kind of that cracking, um, and I think that if I'm remembering correctly, that uh, the, the cracking was quite a bit worse on the south and west side of the tree. That's right. And so, well, actually, and interestingly enough, um, another name for sun scald is southwest winter injury. And so, <laughs> tip, if you are seeing some uh, some bark cracking on the south and west sides of your tree. Right now, that is a good chance that we are dealing with some sun scald issues that happened happened over the winter. Um, and sun scald is real; it's a result of the of fluctuations between the, the daytime and nighttime temperatures. And as the as the sun warms up, those um, the cells right underneath the bark, and then it gets cold at night. Those cells die, and then we start to see some of that bark cracking. As far as control, um, typically, especially on an older tree like that, you probably don't have to do a whole lot. I would look, um, keep an eye on it though, make sure it is still leafing out correctly. On younger trees, maybe you'd wanna think about wrapping them. Um, and as far as how, how long will honey locusts live? Ideally, probably 50 years or so. So it should be a, a long lasting tree. Excellent, so it's always good to be able to differentiate between, ah, is it a rod in a spot or is it just nature? Or is it just being natural? Naughty? Yep. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. All right, Elizabeth, uh, this was human error, unfortunately. Um, herbicide damage, big time. And it was um, a lawn spray thing that escaped into the garden. It is peonies, rhubarb, horseradish, and a rose plant. <clears throat> and they were sprayed in May. And of course, the viewer's question is, will they make it? Is there anything that can help them survive? Can, can the rhubarb and the horseradish be consumed? <laughs> it's all yours <laughs> at that point. Any time, time we see that cupping, curling, distortion, I believe it was a broadleaf <clears throat> weed killer, like a 2,4-D that they used. Right. And so that, those symptoms are what we're gonna commonly see. The answer is it depends. It depends on whether it was drifted, it depends on if it volatilized, it depends on so many different things. Um, so the answer is, is, I don't know if some of those perennials are gonna come back. It's just gonna be a waiting game. Now, can you eat the rhubarb and the horseradish and the whatnot? We don't recommend that you eat any of those um, vegetable crops that have been treated with herbicide because there's no pre-harvest interval from when it's applied to when it's safe to eat. Um, so for sure, we would not recommend that you eat anything off of it this year. And we're gonna try to baby those plants around, make sure that they have adequate amount of moisture. We're not gonna fertilize them at all this year because what that's gonna do is they're already stressed and then we add insult to injury by putting that fertilizer on there. So we're not gonna fertilize them. And then it's just gonna be a waiting game to see what happens. Um, hopefully they come out of it, but again, we can't guarantee anything at this point in time. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. That's pretty unfortunate. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, well, for those hard to reach areas in the landscape, sometimes there's really nothing that works better than a string, string trimmer or a weed whacker to keep the edges of your yard looking trim. But beware, mechanical gadgetry can also do some really permanent damage to some of the plants we don't want to harm. Let's hear from Jeff Culbertson about how to use tools safely and smartly. So technology gives us all the ability to do more in our landscapes and our lawns than ever before. Faster, more efficiently, and in some cases really do a better job for us. A couple of things to keep in mind when using some of these new tools and equipment is safety for yourself and then safety for your landscape, your lawn as well. Uh, these things uh, by themselves are great. They really help us get a lot done, uh, but at the same time they can cause us a few problems. For instance, uh, when protecting yourself, the first thing that you're gonna wanna do is make sure that you have the proper PPE that's listed with the manufacturer of that piece of equipment you're using. They're all gonna be a little different. They may have some different suggestions, but it's important to look at your manual, make sure that you have the proper equipment before you go out, because obviously it's no fun if you end up getting injured by that new piece of equipment that you just purchased. The next thing to think about is how you're properly using it. For instance, something like this leaf blower here that seems fairly simple and really can't cause you many problems, uh, it's important to know that sometimes you can inadvertently cause some other problems with it. 
So for instance, when you're blowing off your sidewalk or your driveway, make sure you're not sending debris from there that you may not want in your lawn um, uh, from the sidewalk. So for instance, salt, sand, that sort of thing uh, from this winter, you're not gonna wanna send that into your lawn or into your landscape. That may be something that you pile up separately and clean that up later. Also with the leaf blower, you may inadvertently, if you're getting close to a perennial bed, dislodge some of the perennials. <clears throat> you end up moving some of the mulch, that sort of thing. So it's important to take it easy as you come around those, feather that control on that blower so that you're not pulling those perennials out or sending the, the mulch away. So the string trimmer is another great tool. I think we probably, every home has at least one of these. Um, everybody wants to use it. It's a fun thing to use. You can get a lot done in a short amount of time. So the great thing about them is that they are easy to use. Again, make sure you have the right PPE on according to the manufacturer to protect yourself. Um, and then again, we're looking at uh, what possible problems we could have. You know, a common mistake with first time users of something like this is to cut the grass too short to scalp the lawn. Uh, and maybe even some experienced folks may think, ah, I'll save myself a couple of weeks if I cut it really short. We end up having some turf problems, making it more susceptible to disease and weeds. And then again, you're, you're dealing with another set of issues. So it's, a, it's really important when you're using the string trimmer is to try to keep the height that you're cutting the grass at the same height you're mowing. The other thing too with these is it's amazing, even though it's just a nylon string, the amount of damage it can do to not just your leg, but also to plants that you have in your landscape. The bark of trees and shrubs are very sensitive. They're not, especially young trees and shrubs, so you can really do a lot of damage with these. So that's why it's important that we have a good mulch area around them to protect us from that sort of thing. Now mowing kind of works right into this. With mowing, it's the same sort of principle. Um, the damage that bumping, repeated bumping into a tree with a mower could cause is something that you won't see immediately, but over a period of time, you may notice some dying back of the bark and some damage to the tree and really end up ending that tree's life much sooner. So again, we look at pulling the mulch out away. It makes your mowing easier, faster, more efficient. Uh, so you're gonna spend less time doing that kind of thing and more time spending time in your garden and your perennial bed. We all know that mulching your landscape beds and around those trees not only conserves water and keeps the soil warm, it also goes a long way toward preventing serious damage to all those plants. And as we just saw, even a blower can bend, break, send sharp debris into the flowers and the other ornamentals and send your mulch flying all over everything too. So be careful with those things. All right, we have another set of pictures. Bring them on. Okay, and you and Jody did an ant thing last year. We did. So yeah. you're going to be happy about this. It's we love a, ants. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little hard to see because a they're away. they're a, kind of a lighty color, but he just that. wants to know what kind of ants these are. Based on what I can see here, I would I would classify these as field ants. Based on the mound that I see in the back and sort of the shape that I can see on their back, I would say they're a part of that large group of ants. They can be red, they can be black, they can be brown lots of different species. If we wanted to confirm this, we'd need to get it under the scope and look at the top of their thorax, that second body segment. If it's a carpenter ant, it's rounded like a football helmet. If it's a field ant, it's got two humps like a camel's back. So that's the way that we tell the difference between them. Field ants also don't live in wood. They live in the soil. They like the margins of some of our landscapes and our fields and places like that. And when they build, it can be really tall or it can be really wide. And there's some data about the width and the height can tell you how many ants may be under there. And I think we also had a picture of so a lot of dirt kind of mounded yeah. up into the yard. When that happens, it can damage a mower. It can, you can smother. Mow over them. Yeah, you can mow over them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they don't be, like that. It can be contact. fun to see them all you blow all on the, the side. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or you, it can damage that mower, it can smother the turf. Some of them will actually sting plants and destroy them and clear cut the area before they move in. Really? So if you wanted to control them, there are some things you can do. There's a publication from the University of Wisconsin that describes probing the soil and then treating with an insecticide. But for the most part, we would wanna leave these ants be. They control lots of pests in the landscape and we just wanna have them as part of a healthy ecosystem. All right, excellent, thank you. They can sting plants, how about that? Yep, yep.
All right. So. <laughs> and people. And people. And people. <laughs> okay. So your uh, questions and pictures, Matt, are turf ID. Um, we have first off, um, what is this one? Clumpy, and this is an imperial. And wondering what this one might be and the control. And then I think we also have a series of pictures that are one that is invading and, and strangling bluegrass. Yep. And that's from Bridgeport. Port. So these are all kind of Western. Yeah, but by the looks of those first two, um, it's, it's kind of tough to tell without getting really close to it. But my first thought is if, if it greens up early for you, uh, it could be windmill grass. And that one kind of spreads bigger and bigger every year. And the telltale sign for that would be when it seeds out. It has seed heads in July, roughly, and they blow away. They're, it's like a tumble windmill grass. So if it does that in the summertime, that's what it is. But other than that, I mean, it, it could also be a tall fescue clump. Mm -hmm. um, but just it's, it's tough to tell by the, the height of those pictures and not actually looking at them closely. Okay, so probably the same thing in the other one. Yeah, board, that, that last picture, yeah. that one could be quack grass. Okay. And that one is a little different, and there's also no uh, selective control for that. So Roundup is probably the best one for quack grass. And I actually have a sample here, if that's the one it is. Uh, it has like clasping auricles around it. So if you look, <laughs> if you look closely at where the leaf meets the, the plant or the shaft of the plant, and you pull it back, there's actually these like two fingers that wrap around it. Uh, so that's that's the easiest way to tell, and that's that's quack grass then. And it, it spreads. It's like a hug. Yep, yeah, it's, <laughs> hugging, it's hugging itself because yeah. it likes it so much. I was thinking of crab pinchers. And, and that one can spread by rhizomes in the lawn. Uh, you can see a rhizome here. Yeah. Um, but that one also, the only control for that one is Roundup, and it's multiple applications because they survive underground, so you have to wait for them to regrow and then retreat. Um, so. Yeah. You know, we have had an awful lot of pictures this year of identify this grass in the turf I want. Just remind our viewers, if you can send us a really good close-up, we, we really kind of have to have that yeah, to be able to give you the... I mean, just by looking at that clump, yeah. that first one was maybe windmill grass. That's, that's oh, as can. good as I have. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Matt. All right. Uh, Kyle, this is a viewer uh, who has a, a spruce. Okay has what she calls a white powdery looking substance on the branches and this is the, the the big tree and then she's saying that the needles around the white powdery you can kind of see it up in the upper left hand corner on the branch itself mm -hmm. um, what is it and what can she do about it well, this that, is in Ralston Ralston okay um, yeah so that that kind of white powdery uh, pitch looks to me like cytospora. Um, so cytospora is a can one of those cankers that the spruces get, and it's, uh, cytospora is very common on, on spruces. And luckily, if we're only seeing some of this white pitch on, on these smaller branches, um, pruning is still a, will still be a good option. And so just, I would recommend pruning out those, pruning out those branches that, where you do see that pitch. Um, otherwise, that cytospora can spread throughout the tree. Now, if you get closer to the main trunk and you're noticing a lot of this pitch um, there on the main trunk, now you're probably going to need to start thinking about replacing the tree. But if you're just seeing it on some of these bran uh, smaller branches, prune it and you should be good to go. All right, thank you, Kyle. Hopefully she doesn't see it on the trunk. Yes, hopefully it's not on the trunk. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, uh, this is actually uh, on the golf course at Broken Bow. I'll come and out and take a look at it. Beautiful cottonwood that uh, apparently attracted the lightning so it didn't hit the golfers that were still out there, Matt, like they shouldn't have those been, right? <laughs> <laughs> but of course, he's wondering whether the tree will survive and then this, this big chunk of bark and, that is kind of hanging, what, what should be done here? Sadly, that piece of bark is not going to glue itself back down. Mm -hmm. It's going to plate off. So, I mean, you might as well just take one step and take it off. Um, the thing to keep in mind when it comes to lightning strikes is it moves through the plant and it comes down one side and it's going to blow off on the other side. And so the, the downside is, is more than likely because it's a cottonwood and because it's a fast growing and it's a weak wooded plant, you're probably going to see death on some of those branches and you're probably going to have to remove at least the one where it, the lightning actually hit it because um, there's probably significant damage there. Just wait and see what happens when it leafs out. If it leafs out smaller than normal, if it's not leafing out by June on, a, on some of those sides, um, 
you're probably going to notice that you're going to need to remove some of those branches. It's just going to be a matter of time, though, to see how much that damage is. Unfortunately, you know, we don't recommend a lot of fertilizers for trees, but we're not going to fertilize that tree because we don't want to fertilize a stressed plant. It's on a golf course, so it's probably getting more than enough water from the sprinklers on the golf course. And I, it would just wait and see what happens. But I think eventually you're probably going to have to remove that tree. If not this year, then potentially maybe over the winter or next year. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Well, we finally got started planting this week out in our garden. Terry James and our master gardeners started on the containers. They are looking fantastic. Let's take a few minutes to check out what's going on at the Backyard Farmer Garden. Pretty excited in the backyard farmer garden this week. We brought all of our plants out of the greenhouse. They have hardened off. We've separated them between veggies and flowers so we kind of know what's what. We put the shade stuff down in the shade so that they can harden off in the shade and not get too much sun. And then now we're starting to do our containers and containers are so much fun and they're so versatile. Everyone should have at least one container in their home. Even people that live in an apartment can have in a container. Couple of things that you should really look at when you are doing containers is you want really good soil. Make sure that you go by high quality soil. That's the base of all your plants and that's where your plants are gonna live, those roots, and you wanna give it a good home for them to live. You want to use slow release fertilizer in the container when you first plant your flowers. And then you wanna remember the three design rules, thriller, filler, spiller. Those threes, that thriller is that big, cool thing that you're gonna show off in your plant. Those fillers are gonna be all that texture and color that's gonna play off that thriller. And then the spillers are gonna be those not nice softening plants that are gonna fill over the sides of your container. That's what's gonna make a great container. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check ours out for ideas. You know, sometimes we tend to focus more on what's happening in the garden rather than in those containers, but it really looks like they're off to a great start this year as always. Grow, growing stuff in the greenhouse, putting stuff out there. Hopefully now uh, the weather will cooperate, and if it doesn't, Master Gardeners will help. Yeah, more water. <laughs> more water. <laughs> yeah. All right, so Jonathan, uh, question time. This is a Blair viewer. Okay. Uh, saw an article on a website uh -oh. about yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the wisdom of trying a red cedar spray on the vegetable plants to control Japanese beetles. Okay. Okay. Uh, red cedar oil, I've never seen any data about it used against Japanese beetles, so I can't say that I would support that. It's also an oil, which if you use those improperly on certain plants, you're gonna burn the plant really badly. Mm -hmm. So I would say I would hesitate on that one until there's some research that's done if red cedar actually repels the Japanese beetle. And if it's warm like it has been the last few days, I would definitely avoid using it because that's just gonna burn the plant. All right, uh, Matt, a violet question. Um, what, what to use now on violets that are taking care of uh, yeah. over the lawn or not? <clears throat> well, you can use something now to knock them back. That's, that's a tougher one to control, obviously. Um, but it's gonna take multiple applications, so you're probably better off if you are going to treat now, you're probably going to have to treat again in four weeks, and that's usually that timing, uh, four weeks apart. And using the products with triclopyr in them, that one's actually the best one that works on uh, that type of weed. So just look for ones with that product in there. Most broadleaf control herbicides have that in there. All right. Kyle, this is an indoor plant question with pictures that were a little hard to tell. Do you know Do you know what would attack a ficus or is it just the fact that it's ficus and something moved it? I'm guessing it's the fact that it's ficus and it's indoors and was moved. <laughs> and, well, and she can probably send us some yes, closer up yep. pictures maybe just in case. All right, Elizabeth, Norfolk, uh, Linden's three to four years old, about 10 feet tall, so doing pretty well. The lower limbs need pruning, I'm guessing, for lawn, and uh, is wondering, could they do that now? I know it's they're a little delayed up north. Yes, um, in central Nebraska, we are also a little delayed, so you wanna make sure that those leaves are fully on and fully emerged and all the way out. 
You can prune at that point in time. We don't want to remove any more than one third of the tree at any time, and we want to try to not remove any <coughs> limbs that are bigger than an inch in diameter. Um, so you can do that. Be prepared that they could weep a little. Um, the best time to prune is usually going to be when you can see the branching structure either early in the spring or, or late after they lose them. But they're actually doing more research that says you can do summer pruning and it actually heals over better. Mm -hmm. So you're getting to the perfect time to go ahead and prune those off. Right. Um, and they, they say you can prune any time the saw is sharp. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Let's start the lightning round. Elizabeth, are you ready? Yes. <laughs> they pan over at the worst times. <laughs> this is Elsie, Nebraska. It is an old heirloom yellow rose. Uh, she wants to know whether she should divide it or take cuttings to propagate and save it. Yeah, I would take cuttings. Um, that would be your best bet. All right. Uh, an Omaha viewer wants to know whether preen is a good pre-merge to use around trees after the, the turf has been taken out. Yeah, preen is a, a good pre-emerge for a lot of different ones. You're going to have to read and follow those label instructions to make sure you put it on thick enough and you reapply it enough. All right. Um, two sweetgrass questions. One is, does sweetgrass grow in Omaha? I don't know. Pass. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not going to know whether it died out in Central City, are you? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Stumped you. Okay. How about, um, this is a viewer who wants to know whether he can prune the lower branches of a maple now for mowing, or should he wait till fall or until summer? You can do summer pruning once the leaves are fully emerged. All right. Why shouldn't you use water from the rain barrel in a garden? The reason you don't want to use water from a rain barrel is because it could potentially be contaminated because of the critters on the roof or the birds that are sitting up there. And so it could be um, contaminated with either E. coli or salmonella. So we don't want to put it on vegetables that we eat. All right, excellent, nice job, sort of. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> I did the best I could. <laughs> Tough on you tonight. Okay, your turn, Kyle. I don't know. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> All right, we have actually a viewer who has Taylor Junipers, young ones, and is okay. for the first time seeing cedar apple rust galls on them. Anything to do now, or are we too late? Uh, yeah, not a whole lot to do right now. Um, best time to control those galls will be um, in the spring and the fall. All right, uh, viewers in the Lincoln area are seeing tiny little button mushrooms all over in the mulch beds. Are they harmful or edible? Um, I would not say they're edible. If they're harmful, I really don't know without actually seeing them, but never just assume a mushroom is edible. All right, a uh, viewer has branches of a crab apple that leafed out and then croaked. Any idea on that one? Um, might be some sort of canker. I'd follow that branch back and see if there's something that's kind of girdling it, preventing the nutrients from reaching those, those uh, end, end leaves. All right. Uh, have you had samples of boxwood blight in the clinic yet? We have not. As right. far as I know, boxwood blight is not in Nebraska yet, and we hope not to find it. Perfect. Is blossom end right on tomatoes a disease or is that a nutrition issue? That is a nutrition issue. It's act, uh, typically a calcium deficiency, actually. All right, nice job. See, that's not so hard. It wasn't. And I beat Elizabeth. <laughs> this wasn't good enough. You're welcome. <laughs> Make you feel good. All right, are you ready, Matt? Yeah. So yes. when the turf is growing this fast, which it is doing right now, should it be bagged or mulched or doesn't it make any difference? Well, mulch more often. Otherwise, you probably have to bag it. Otherwise, it's going to sit on top. All right. This is a Donovan viewer that wants to know whether if they overseed a really thin fescue lawn with buffalo grass, can they expect the buffalo grass to outcompete the fescue? <clears throat> if it is thin, you'll probably have a mixed in, but buffalo and tall fescue. I don't think it'll completely take the tall fescue out. All right. Um, a viewer wants to know whether it is too late to put down a pre-merge for basic lawn weeds. Is it too late or is it time for a second application? Uh, it's never too late to put it down, so you could still do it, and it's going to prevent any broadleaf weeds that seed out from seeding and reproducing next year. Okay. Um, this is a viewer who has uh, acreage and uses 2,4-D to control dandelions when they're up, but wonders if there is a pre-emerge that mm -hmm. could be used on that acreage instead. 
yeah, pre-emergent would help, but I would say a fall application is always going to be the best for those dandelions. So maybe uh, for a big acreage, uh, pendimethalin would be a good one. Okay. All right. Nice job. Ready? Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is a COZAD viewer who wonders how you control white flies on indoor plants. On indoor plants, you can use neem or an insecticidal soap on those indoor plants. All right. And we have another viewer who says they had they were digging in their raised beds. They found all sorts of grub worms. Okay. How do you control grub worms in raised beds? From what I've read about grubs and raised beds like that, it sounds like a joke, but chickens, if you have a friend who has chickens, they will eat the grubs out of the raised bed. Otherwise, it's tough because there's not much labeled for that situation. Hand picking. Hand picking, yeah. All right. We have a viewer who has aphids that are already curled up in the leaves of their vining honeysuckle. How do you control them? You have to get inside of the leaf with a blast of water or with a soap that you're trying to use on them. Okay. Uh, people are wondering whether the noceums are out already because they're getting bitten by something. I would guess that thrips are getting you. I've had several cases of thrips falling out of trees and biting people in Omaha. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have a two inch long lemon and black colored bee-like thing with no stripes and shiny wings that look like a plastic bag. Could be a carpenter bee, could be a queen bee that's out and about as well. They're the ones that start the colony early in the season, so you may have seen royalty passing through your garden. <laughs> well, and the lovely thing for our viewers, just in case, is that was actually one of the beauty shots at the break, was that bee in those, or that, yeah, carpenter bee in the flowers. <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, what are our plants of the week? Our plants of the week, we're gonna start with the tall round ones in the up here. Um, what we've got is the giant allium, or, um, the flowering onion. Um, these guys aren't really that big. There's actually bigger ones out there, but um, they can be on stems that are up to four foot tall. And so here we have this long skinny stem with this big puff at the top. So it's kind of fun to see. The foliage goes dormant after flowering. So that one's really fun um, to kind of look at. It's fun to watch the pollinators come over and kind of go after it. Um, the other one is gonna be the columbine. And this is the, um, it's an old fashioned, it's a double. If we take a look at the inside of the flower, uh, one way to know the columbine is the columbine Columbine has these little kickbacks on the flower back here. Um, but that columbine is one of those um, that can reseed itself fairly readily. And so that's why we have the color diversity. We've got the purples and the pinks and the whites and things like that. Um, these guys do really like that shade and they, they can live in cracks of sidewalks and in between bricks and things like that. So they're a hardy crew. Um, and so you just never know what color you're gonna get with these guys, but they're just two fun ones that are early spring bloomers and these alliums are just a lot of fun to see. They are, and, and that white one, that bulb actually came to us from our, our dear master gardener, George Edgar. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of memory for him to mm -hmm. float that white thing. All right, so our next set of pictures, Jonathan. Um, this is a Nebraska City viewer who said these divots appeared overnight and they have a tiny oh, yeah. worm in them and okay. a really happy fat robin. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the pits themselves are really awesome. What we're looking at here are antlion pits. At the bottom of this is an uh, insect that some people call a doodle bug. And that's because when they crawl on the surface of the sand, they kind of leave these weird doodles in the sand. At the base of that pit though, it waits. It's got these big open sickle shaped jaws that it has waiting. And when an ant gets inside of the pit, the incline is so steep it can't get back out. And it just tumbles down to the bottom of the pit where the ant lion grabs it in its jaws and devours it whole pretty much. It's a really awesome insect. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> when it becomes an adult, it looks like a damselfly or a lacewing sort of. It's really long abdomen and kind of lacy looking wings. But as an immature, it looks like a bulldog with sickles coming out of its mouth. It's, it's pretty, <laughs> Metal. I, think you should, I think you should bring one in for a second. Okay, I'll, I'll look around. <laughs> All right. Matt, uh, your question is actually another ID. Okay. This is a Seward viewer, but this is probably a little easier to identify. Um, wondering what this grass is and how to control it. And I, I think this one is also the one I talked about earlier as being quack grass. I, it's a really good prick picture. Mm -hmm. uh, I zoomed in on it and I was actually able to see some of those clasping oracles that I talked about. Uh, so I'm pretty sure it's quack grass by, by the picture you sent. So it was, it was a good picture. Okay, and how does he control it? That's the one that there really is no control <laughs> for. So <laughs> if you have it, I think I saw it's there's bluegrass in there, or you said that too, but uh, if it's thin enough, you can go in there and spot treat with Roundup. 
because uh, that's really the only control. There's no non-selective that's going to be safe on the other grasses. So. All right. We're a good soil knife. Yeah, dig, dig, cutting dig. it out. If there's not many of them, get them now because they'll, they'll keep growing year after year. All Does right. it quack or do ducks eat it? Or? No, it's not as exciting as your oh. dog. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually kind of a pain. Oh. <laughs> All right, Kyle, uh, this is a Cass County viewer, has about a 60-year-old ponderosa pine. Okay drastically thinning in the last few years. I uh, can't see anything, but uh, this is what she does see. New cones do appear. Um, are, wh what do we have here? Uh, looks to me like we're dealing with some sort of needle blight on, um, on this pine, and kind of difficult to tell if it's uh, Dothostroma or Diplodia um, needle blight. Both are, both are common on, on pines, especially when we get some older pines like this. So one of the ways to tell them apart is Dothostroma will tend to have um, bands on the, on the needles, whereas Diplodia tends to, you'll see a lot more of those kind of black fruiting bodies at the base of the needle. Um, control for both is pretty much the same. Uh, if you can do some pruning to increase airflow and decrease humidity within the canopy, that should help things dry out, get less infection. Um, also, uh, fungicides are fairly effective for both of these needle blights, um, but we are getting past the time when, when you'd want to apply those. So maybe think about application next spring. All right, thank you, Kyle. Elizabeth, a couple of cherry questions. Uh, one is a viewer got uh, something that he thinks was probably mislabeled. It was, he thought he ordered a Bing, and this is what it looks like. <clears throat> Any idea on this one? Yeah, we tried to do some looking, and we were looking to see if it was black cherry or bird cherry, you know, and, and it's difficult to exactly tell. We do know it's in that Prunus family, so, you know, he did kind of get what he wanted. And, um. <laughs> yeah, and then the second one I think here is a weeping cherry. Planted five years ago, it died, uh, and then it came up as, as something that is really quite lovely and is wondering what came up and is this worth saving? She says it's growing like gangbusters. And what probably happened is we had a weeping cherry on a rootstock. Mm -hmm. And what happened is, is that scion or that top part died. And so now what you have is that rootstock. Now the rootstock is usually kept in check by that scion or that top part. Now that that top part's gone, that, that rootstock is gonna go like gangbusters and it's just gonna grow. We don't know exactly what you have. Um, it's gonna be something in that prunus family again, but we don't know exactly which kind it's gonna be. And so we don't really know how big it's gonna be or how tall it's gonna get. But you know, the hard part is, is the way that it's attached to that um, weeping cherry, it's weakly attached. So I mean, if that tree continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger, it's weakly attached to that lower trunk. We get a windstorm or we get a snowstorm or ice, it's just gonna snap off at that location. So that's something to keep in mind is if it does get larger, you're gonna have some issues because of the way it's attached to the trunk. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, some of you might have noticed that we've promoted this feature for a couple of weeks and we finally get a chance to show you that you don't have to look far for a nice spring blooming tree, there are several that are native to Nebraska. People love the beauty of our spring flowering trees, but we don't often think about the great diversity there is out there. We go for ornamental pears, which are really a cautionary note right now, or we choose crab apples. But if we think about our native trees, we have a lot to choose from. Let's start with looking at serviceberry, which is absolutely beautiful in flower. It is an understory tree, meaning it really likes to live in an environment where it is under the canopy of some of the big guys. The flowers might be fleeting, but then it's followed by beautiful fruit that is also edible if you get there before the birds do, and it has great fall color. That is one of the choices. Let's take a look at a couple of the others that would give you both the native, the understory, and the beauty in the spring. Another beautiful white alternative is our native choke cherry. These great racemes of pretty flowers, they don't smell great, but they're not terrible. And of course, they're followed by edible fruit. The birds love it. It's great in jellies and jams. This is a tree, however, that will sucker and form a colony. So you do keep, need to keep your eyes on it if you're really after a single stem tree in the landscape. Again, a great alternative to those white ornamental pears or crab apples. Of course, people love the screaming magenta flowers of our native redbud, 
which is truly an understory tree and limited in its range kind of into the forested parts of the state. As I said, it wants to be an understory. It wants to live in a protected location. You also have to be very careful that you get a native seed source. And if you do that and put it in the right spot, you're likely to be able to have it survive. There is a white variety as well. It's equally beautiful. Of course, the flowers are white. Another little known native tree that blooms in the spring is American bladdernut or Staphylia trifoliata. It gets its species name from the three-part leaf. It gets its common name from the bladder-like seed pod that forms on the tree and really stays for quite a long time. It's a little bit of a clump former. Again, not a very long blooming tree, but one that really does add a different dimension to your landscape. And of course, we could go on and we could talk about pawpaw, which is blooming right now and then has a weird edible fruit. We could talk about Eastern hop hornbeam, which is in the birch family. So lots of different choices for native trees that give us that diversity and beautiful bloom in the spring. You know, of course, we want that diversity around our homes, but if your trees are native to our state, there's really a much better chance they'll grow up healthy and happy if you put them in the right spot. Remember that you aren't necessarily native where they are native. <laughs> All right, picture four, Jonathan. Um, this is this is fun. This is Bee Hotels. Yeah. And and, <laughs> and what he's really wondering is, and we've actually talked about this a little without the pictures, but can okay. he drill those holes out? Okay. Should he should he just always start over? Okay. What do you do here? He wants to be a bee bellhop. <laughs> so Perfect. He wants to help them out and and help their house. Uh, you can redrill them if they've been around for a couple of years and you haven't re uh, replenished the stock that's in there. You can take those blocks out and drill them back in. You can just clean them with a pipe cleaner as well. Sanitize with a half a cup of bleach and a gallon of water. That'll get rid of any pathogens that may be caught up in there. And then you can reuse those blocks. Some of the different university publications do say that after three years, though, you should switch things out and get new material in there. So just think about that, depending on the timeline of things that you've got going on in your bee hotel there. Lots of cool insects that he had in there. One of them was a grass carrying wasp. That's always Is that fun the to thing see. with the little deals? Yeah, she's that. carrying the, yeah. the grass back home. She's building a little nest inside that tube. She's going to fashion it with tree crickets that she stings right. and paralyzes and let her, lets her babies eat. Well, good for her. So it's not just bees, you're helping out lots of things. <laughs> All right. Um, Matt, this is actually a weed question instead of an idea of grass. Um, she's from Fremont. She says it's trying to take over her lawn in large areas. And a little follow-up, she says that like pulling it is like trying to pull barbed wire out yeah, from her lawn. Yeah, uh, you have a lovely strawberry patch, mm -hmm. a wild strawberry patch. Um, and it will continue to spread because it spreads by stones on top ground and it'll set roots so it'll have daughter plants and just keep spreading year after year or throughout the summer. Uh, so one thing you may want to do is encourage more grass in that area because it's probably thin and that's generally when they take over or if it's in a shaded area uh, just look at a different cultivar that grows better there. Um, if you want to try and control it and get the grass growing maybe some fertilizer um, but the product I mentioned earlier, one that contains uh, 2,4-D obviously works okay, but not very good. So you want to have a combination of that, uh, dicamba, and MCPP. And that those three are in a lot of products like I mentioned. So look for that. Tough to control weed, but it can be done. And that darn strawberry, I don't know who brings it in, darn birds. But yes, I know. It's yeah. All over my yard. Oh. Encourage a thick lawn and it'll, it'll help with that. Exactly. Too. All right, Kyle, um, this is a lilac question. Okay. Planted about 16 years ago as a sucker off a very old one, uh, grown large. And yes, they have removed some of the large branches, but they're seeing this at some of the others. And they're, did they trigger this by pruning? They're wondering, is this a is this a goner or what do we what do we see here? Well, uh, to me, it looks like you have some lichen that's growing on the growing on the lilac. Could be a fungus, but uh, I, I, I like lichens better more than fungi, so <laughs> say it's a might be a lichen. Um, lichens are pretty cool, not as cool as some of the insects that Jonathan's been talking about, <laughs> but um, lichens are it's a symbiotic relationship between uh, fungi and either an algae or a bacteria. So it's kind of a couple things working together. Um, probably not anything that you need to be too concerned about, although it, uh, there is a chance that 
anytime you have a lot of a lot of lichen growth on on the outside of a outside of a, of a branch or cane, something like that, that can be a sign that maybe there's some underlying issues going on. So really just keep an eye out for that. Um, if you have any cane, if you haven't removed the canes in a rec in recently, go ahead and get rid of some of those larger canes. They will attract some uh, cane bores and that can, that can lead to a lot more issues. Correct. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I concur, Doc. <laughs> All right. So he's doing the right things. We'll just yep. hope it works. All right. So um, as long as we are talking about <laughs> lilacs and other plants that are having winter dieback, your first question actually is from an Iowa viewer and has Shasta viburnum, Elizabeth, uh, which is one of the double files and apparently is having a lot of dieback in it this year. Wondering, is, is this typical for this particular cultivar in this location? And what should he do about it? And then the second one is actually an old lilac bush with, with a lot of dead in that one. Also wonders if they can prune that back and how and when. So a lot of winter kill kind of stuff going on here. And with that viburnum, what you're gonna wanna do is right now you're gonna wanna prune out the dead. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna wanna evaluate and see what you have. Um, it's one of those things where it can be fairly common in that kind of a viburnum and in that location. So it's not uncommon. Um, some winters we see it heavier than other winters. So, so that is something that can happen on that one. Now when it comes to the lilac, Yes, you can prune out the big stuff and we wanna prune out anything that's big enough that we can't put our hand around it because it, then it can have the ash lilac borer. Um, the thing to keep in mind though is if you're trying to get a saw in that big lilac and only remove one third of the canes, it's gonna be extremely difficult to do that because we wanna do one third of the canes over a three year time span, you've completely rejuvenated that shrub. With one of that size that's 10 to 15 foot tall, what you can do is you can rejuvenate and you can cut back eight inches above the ground. And it takes out all that dead wood and it takes out those big canes that, that you wanna get rid of. Now, it's not gonna bloom that spring and it could potentially not bloom the following spring, but you have completely rejuvenated that shrub. Lilacs are pretty hardy, um, so don't worry about that you're gonna kill your lilac, but that is an option for you. Um, I did it and it took a few years for it to bloom and then we got a frost and so, yeah, anyway. <laughs> but it did eventually bloom. All right, thanks Elizabeth. Well, good announcements of fun things in the gardening world and we're gonna start with one that is iris. It's iris times. So this is Lincoln Iris Society's annual show, Sunday the 19th, two to five at St. Andrew's Lutheran Church here in Lincoln. Our second one is also Iris on the other end of the state. This is the Monument Valley one, uh, June 2nd and 3rd at the Panhandle Research and Extension Center in Scotts Bluff. The third one is us. And we will be on location, Backyard Farmer Live, which is uh, at the Rock Garden at Harmon Park in Kearney on Sunday, June 3rd at one o'clock in the afternoon and no ticket is required. So show up, heckle us, enjoy us, and we'll <laughs> love having you there. <laughs> All right, so we have just a little bit of time for a handful of questions. Uh, Jonathan, this is a, a, a person in Bellevue wants to know about what to do about asparagus bugs. If it's asparagus beetle, you could use permethrin or carbaryl on your asparagus plants. Just pay close attention to that post-harvest interval. All right, Matt. So Creeping Charlie, are we past the window for doing any treatment on that? We have, still have questions about Creeping Charlie treatment. That one is also similar to any of them now. Uh, it's gonna take at least two apps. Uh, fall is obviously better. But if you wanna wait, you know, in a month, apply, and then in a month, apply again, uh, the two apps will help tremendously versus one. All right, um, we don't know where this viewer is from, Kyle, but they have a problem with spotted wilt virus on tomatoes. Okay. What can we do about that? Uh, best thing to control a lot of your viruses on tomatoes is thrip control. Uh, most of these viruses are spread by thrips. So if you're able to manage those thrips, you should decrease the virus, um, virus load on your tomatoes. One of the things though, whenever we're work, worrying about controlling thrips, need to make sure we're not harming the bees as well. All right, Elizabeth, should a Skylar viewer fertilize their peonies now if they're looking yellow, you have 10 seconds. Depends on what your pH is. <laughs> if your pH is off, that's gonna tie up some of the nutrients that are available. You can try a little fertilizer, um, but my guess is that it could be pH related.